Amen. Christ is risen. You may be seated. Thank you, worship team, and good morning, Stonebridge. It's good to see you this morning. My name is Randy. I'm one of the pastors here, and it's my delight to uh, welcome you. You know, it's important that we start with the story of the resurrection. So I would invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 20, the Gospel of John chapter 20, and I'm going to read the story of the first uh, folks that witnessed the resurrection. If you didn't bring a Bible, we have Bibles in the rack in front of you on page 906 in that Bible. John chapter 20, after a, a very quiet weekend, we find people coming to the tomb And let's pick up the story in John chapter 20, and I'll be reading through statement number 18. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb both of them running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed." For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They've taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they've laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me. For I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he said these things to her. You know, as we talk about uh, Christianity, we have to admit that the Christian faith claims to be the exclusive way to God. (laughs) And that makes a lot of people angry. We live in a country where people believe that there are many ways to God, and uh, to say that only one way is the right way bothers a lot of people. As you read the New Testament, you discover that people from the very beginning were angry with Jesus, the founder of Christianity. He made people angry wherever he went. Uh, Judas, one of his trusted friends, uh, used him to gain 30 pieces of silver and sold him so he could be arrested. His best friend, Peter, denied that he knew him. The religious leaders accused him of blasphemy and brought him to the Romans who beat him and hung him on a Roman cross. Wherever Jesus goes, he stirs up people and makes them mad. But behind all of this, there's a key question that uh, Jesus himself asked his disciples and that we have to be asked ourselves this morning. Jesus at one point said, Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? I'd like to ask you that question this morning. Who do you say that Jesus is? And here's another question, what will you do with Jesus? Uh, It's interesting that the bestseller throughout all all these years has been the Bible. And recently there's been a series on television on the History Channel called The Bible, and millions of viewers have watched it. People are curious about what the Bible teaches. Those of us that study the Bible a lot may be a little miffed at Hollywood's presentation of it. There are things included there that you don't find in the Bible. But I think it does point to the fact that though people may be angry that Christianity says it's the only way to God, they're still curious about what the teachings of the Bible say. Not everyone feels like they're curious. Um, The late atheist Christopher Hitchens once said that religion poisons everything. 
Of course, when you say religion poisons everything, you could also say, this, say the same about uh, money and politics. <laughs> it, it, it has a way of poisoning everything. So it's not just religion, uh, as Christopher Hitchens says, that poisons things. But, you know, um, one of the things that we notice about Christianity is that it's totally different in the story it tells about its founder than other religions. For instance, Confucius. There's much written about Confucius. He evidently died at 72 to 73 years of age, an elderly man surrounded by people who loved him, saying wise things. Muhammad, the founder of Islam, died at age 63, surrounded by his 13 wives, saying profound things. These are the heroes of their religions. Christianity is the only faith system that says that our hero died at age 30 to 33, somewhere in there, as a criminal. Christianity is unique in that respect, that our founder died at a young age, accused of crimes he did not commit, on a Roman cross. Jesus was betrayed, denied, forsaken, and executed. And the question for us this morning is, what will you do about Jesus? Jesus, standing before us as the resurrected Lord, says, who do you say I am, and what will you do with me? We all must ask and answer those two questions. In order to help us guide our thinking, I would like to take you through the events of this week. We'll look at the death of Christ and its meaning. We'll look at the resurrection and whether it's true and its meaning. And then we'll look at the ascension of Jesus Christ. And my hope is that by the time we're done talking about these things, you will see that you'll have an idea of who Jesus is and what you should do with him. Because that is an unavoidable question. So let's look at it. Uh, first of all, is Christ's death a tragedy or a triumph? You know, here's the story of an innocent man sentenced to death. His disciples were asleep in the, the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus went through great emotional turmoil. Judas betrayed him and had him arrested. Peter denied knowing him. Religious leaders arrested and, and tried him. And the Romans beat him and hung him on a cross. Why so much trouble over a man like this? What was it about Jesus that made people so angry? Well, Scripture says that at its heart, people were mad at Jesus because he claimed to be God. He claimed to be deity. And so the people of Jesus' day accused him of blasphemy and killed him. You see, Jesus presents himself as God, and they felt threatened. And people feel threatened today about Jesus for the same reasons. People generally want a safe Jesus, and Jesus is anything but safe. It's very interesting that the atheist Richard Dawkins said that Jesus never existed. Why would an intelligent man who has history before him deny Jesus' existence? N.T. Wright, in his book Simply Christian, suggests that Dawkins refused to believe Jesus existed because he wanted a safe Jesus. You see, we'll do all kinds of things to make Jesus safe. <laughs> now, in Islam, they believe, the Quran teaches, that Jesus is a prophet. Uh, now, the latest and greatest prophet is Muhammad, but Jesus is one in a long line of prophets. Could I suggest to you that this is another attempt to make Jesus safe? Now, many people are graduating from universities today in what we might call a postmodern view, and in that thinking, they admit that Jesus is a good man, but nothing more. Who do you say that I am, Jesus said. All of these are attempts to make Jesus safe. Sometime you should read a great book by C.S. Lewis called Mere Christianity. C.S. Lewis writes this, I am trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. Oh, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg, <laughs> Or he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall flat at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. We are confronted here at the resurrection of Jesus Christ with a man who is not safe, a man who claims to be God and who claims to transform 
our lives. Let me say that we can learn four things from the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. If you're new to Christianity or exploring it, these will be helpful to you. First of all, in Jesus' death on the cross, we learn that we have value in the eyes of God. In fact, in Genesis 1.27, the first book of the Bible, we read these words, God created human beings in His own image. In the image of God, He created them. Male and female, He created them. Jesus Christ, as God, values and cares for us. He cares for you. And His death on the cross reminds us of our value. But we're also reminded of the high command that Jesus gave us. One of his most famous sayings was to a lawyer who was questioning him. And he says this in Matthew 22, 37. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus values us, but he's also given us a great purpose in life. He said his purpose for human life human beings, is to love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Now, as soon as we say that, we see that there's a problem, isn't there? Our problem is we fail to live up to that command. We fail every day to live up to this purpose. I know I'm on shaky ground with some when I say, when Jesus says these words, we feel our guilt. Now, I know we live in a society where guilt is kind of demeaned. Oh, don't let anyone tell you that you're guilty. You've got to decide on your own. You've got to come up with your own way of thinking. Don't listen to anybody else. You just do what's right for you. That's kind of our society's statement here. So here I am as a pastor saying, contrary to that view, Jesus Christ says we're to love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbors as ourselves. And because we fail to live up to that, we have a problem. It's called sin and guilt. Rather than loving God with heart, soul, mind, and strength, we have a tendency to want to rebel against Him. That's happened since the beginning of time. Somebody comes along and starts talking this Jesus talk, and we say, I don't want to hear that. Because it's guilt. A lot of people don't come to church because they don't want to hear things that make them feel guilty. I can understand that. And yet, God says, I've got a purpose for your life. How are you doing with your purpose? And as soon as we hear that, we know guilt. Now, I'm not talking about false guilt, the kind of guilt that many of us have because of voices from the past ricocheting around in our brains. You know, you should have done this better, you should have done that. And sometimes we just do all kinds of bizarre things trying to atone for the things of the past. It's just simply false guilt. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about true, legitimate guilt. Have you ever tried to live up to the Ten Commandments? Some people do. And then we start to see the importance of these words especially interpreted by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. So not only does the Ten Commandments say, I'm not to commit adultery, but Jesus tells me if I look at a woman with lust in my heart, I'm as guilty of committing adultery as if I actually did the act. To love God and let Him mess with my life and to love my neighbor as myself? I mean, let's be honest here. I want to be honest here about something about me. I don't love my wife as I should. In fact, I've told my wife before, if you ever came clean about some of the things I've done, I'd get fired. Because I don't love her. I don't put her needs above mine. I put my needs above hers. I don't, and she's the closest neighbor that I have. I don't love my kids as I should. I remember many times in the past where I demanded things of them that, I, that were just purely wrong. You could bring in the other pastors and the administrative staff of this church or the elders, and you could make a list of my failings. I'm talking about real sin, real guilt. Who can live up to this? We can't. And uh, think of the weight of this. God has been dealing with people like me and you for thousands of years. The accumulated sin and guilt of humanity has been coming before our God, who is described in the Bible as a great king who constructed this universe, is totally pure and holy and infinitely righteous, and sin and rebellion of his subjects on earth has created within him a holy wrath. Somebody needs to be punished. Someone needs to be punished. And that's a frightening thought to us because I look at the great command to love God and love my neighbor and I realize that I'm the one that needs to be punished. The cross helps us with this because it reminds us that action needed to be taken. You know, our country is fond of saying, oh, people just need education. You know, if we just teach them 
things. So if we just teach our way out of it, but has teaching ever helped? I mean, really, I mean, have you ever had a coach who said, do this, do this, do this, and you thought, no, I'm not going to do that, I'm not going to do that, I'm not going to do that. And we think we can live morally on our own. I'm going to make some New Year's resolutions. How are you doing with those, by the way? I, I, can, I can do this. No, we can't. Teaching won't help. We've got a problem. The problem is sin and guilt. The solution is punishment. What do we do? And that's where the death of Jesus Christ comes in. Because according to the Scripture, Jesus Christ died on a Roman cross to bear the weight of sin and guilt. So rather than you and me bearing the brunt of the holy anger of God, His own Son bore the weight. Why? Well, our Bibles tell us in Romans 5.8, God shows His love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. One of the most mind-wrenching, gut-wrenching phrases in the Bible is when Jesus, in one of the last things He said on the cross, He screams out in Aramaic, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani? which it says is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why would Jesus scream these words? Because the weight of human sin and guilt over the centuries was piled on his shoulders, and his father let him die to bear the punishment. Some have said that Jesus Christ on the cross literally faced hell, a separation from his father, in the deepest, most excruciating way possible. You know, we can understand that. It hurts us when we lose someone we love. Some of you have gone through a painful divorce. You know what that's like. It's worse than a death. It's excruciatingly painful. But I submit to you that Jesus, who was the son of his father, being on the cross, bearing the weight of our sins, was more excruciating than we can ever imagine. So though we have value in the eyes of our God, we cannot live up to his purpose for us. And the solution is that Jesus died in our place. And the Bible tells us that those who believe on Jesus Christ are forgiven. And when God looks at us, he no longer sees the sin. He sees Jesus. God is not angry anymore because he poured out his wrath and his anger on Jesus. And that brings us to the fourth point. There is a big story that we have to learn. The big story is a story of hope. It's a story of love. It's the story of John 3.16. That God our Father so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Moses, if you've seen the Bible story on the History Channel, there's that poignant moment where he's telling people, God is going to kill every firstborn child, and they're all worried. He says, we are to kill a lamb, and we're to put the blood on the doorposts, and the Lord is going to come over the, the country, and the homes where the blood of the lamb is not there, he is going to take the firstborn son. And you know from your history books, it did happen. The firstborn child died in all the Egyptian homes, but all the Hebrews were saved, and the Pharaoh said, please leave. That became the initiation of the great Passover and Passover feast, a week-long feast. Do you know that on the day Jesus died was on the very day that the Jewish people were killing the lambs to commemorate what had happened in the Passover? The very day Jesus died was the day that they killed the lambs to commemorate God's rescuing them. Jesus Christ did what lambs could never do. He died on a Roman cross to bring forgiveness to us. And he did it because he chose to do it. He said, not my will, but yours be done. That is the wonderful answer to our dilemma. There's a very interesting movie called Shawshank Redemption. In that movie, there are two main characters who are in prison, Andy and Red. Andy figures out a way to escape from prison. But in order to escape, he has to crawl through the sewer system. And finally, he gets to the sewer system, falls out of the pipe, splashes around in the water. It's raining, just pouring rain, and he stands up and just lets the water drench him. Red says this, narrating, He crawled through a river of filth and came out clean on the other side. And I heard Red say that. I thought, that's what Jesus did. He literally crawled through a river of filth, of sin and guilt. And when he died on that cross, he was clean and he made us clean. In Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ, he presents Jesus dying on the cross. And this is not in the Bible, but he pictures a big teardrop falling from heaven. God the Father weeping over his son. But what happens next is in the Bible. When the teardrop hits the ground, an earthquake breaks out. The temple shudders, 
and the veil in the temple is torn in two. The Holy of Holies. All of a sudden, because of Christ's death, we have access to God through Jesus Christ. It is the only way to God. And it's what Jesus did on the cross 2,000 years ago. The best thing we can do is to admit our guilt and sin and say, God, I agree with you. I don't live up to your purposes for me. I am guilty, but I trust in what Jesus did on the cross to forgive my sins and to open a door for a relationship with you. My friend, if you do that this morning, if you just open your heart and say, God, I want to know you, and through Christ I can, God will reconcile you to, your, to himself. Who is this man? Who do you say that he is? Well, he's the one who died for our sins. As Isaiah would say it, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way. And the Lord laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity, the sin, the guilt of us all. I don't know about you, but that keeps me going. That is an encouraging message. That I don't have to live with guilt anymore. That I don't have to live with sin. And that when God looks at me, he doesn't look at me and say, Randy, I'm angry with you. He looks at me and he says, I see you in Christ. Imagine it this way. Let's say that I had to go before the judge to answer for crimes that I committed. And the prosecuting attorney began to list my failings. Well, Randy Shile, when he was 10 years old, he did this. And when Randy was 15 years old, he did this. And when Randy was 21, he did this. And when Randy was 35, he did this. I'm not telling you what those things are, but I... And then when he was 42, he did this. And that's where I'm going to stop. That's a prosecuting attorney. And then the defense attorney who's representing me stands up and he says to the judge, Judge, everything the prosecuting attorney said is true of my client. He admits to it all. He's guilty. But all that guilt has been atoned for because I gave my blood to save him from it. And he is now free, cleansed in my blood. That's essentially what Jesus does for us. Now we have to go on to the resurrection. As glorious as that thought of, of being forgiven is, did Jesus... Was he really God? Well, the resurrection proves that what he said is true. Did the resurrection really happen? Well, if he did, it brings a lot of hope. When we read John chapter 20, we see that the women came to the tomb because they wanted to prepare the body. They, they were quickly prepared his body for burial because the Passover was coming, so they were in a hurry. The women came to try to finish the job, and they were shocked to see the tomb, the, the uh, rock rolled away from the tomb, and, and where's Jesus? And then it talks about Peter coming and John, and they're looking in. Everybody's confused. What's going on? And um, I, want to, I want to point something out to you. Even skeptics see that there's an honest portrayal of the events here. Because if you are going to talk about a hero, would you describe him as an executed man? Would you describe the hero of this story being looked after by women? In that day and age, the worst thing you would say in presenting a hero story was that all oh, the women came looking. Because women were looked at as second-class citizens. And yet the gospel writers are so honest... They speak of the doubts, the uncertainty. It says John looked at the, uh, the, the clothing there in the tomb and he thought, okay, I believe, but what did he believe? He didn't understand the resurrection. They're struggling with this. When you read a little later in that chapter, John 20, verse 25, we find Thomas, he missed Jesus' resurrection appearances that Mary described and others. And they said to Thomas, we've seen the Lord. But Thomas said, hey, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails... And I place my finger into the mark of the nails and my hand in his side. I will never believe. And later in the story, Jesus comes and appears to Thomas. He says, Thomas, 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 put your hand there. Touch and see. The New Testament gospel writers and the letters of Paul tell us that Jesus appeared to over 500 witnesses on multiple occasions, proving that he was alive. He alive from the dead. He was the resurrected Lord. My encouragement to you, you might be here as a skeptic like Thomas, doubting the things of the Bible. Or you might be like Peter, wrestling with the guilt of denying Jesus. Maybe you followed Jesus when you were younger, but you got away from him. You drifted away. Jesus is standing before you in his resurrected glory today saying, Come home. Come back. I love you. I died for you. I rose again. Come. You see that? Who do you say that I am? What will we do with Jesus? The Bible goes on to say in Acts chapter 1 that Jesus, after 40 days of spending time with his disciples, was raised to glory. You might want to turn over one page, just the next page to page 909, and read these words. After these 40 days of appearing to his disciples, Jesus called them together and he said, verse 6, 
Uh, they're, they're wondering about the kingdom. And Jesus says in verse 7, it's not for you to know about the times or seasons. The Father's fixed by His own authority. And then He says this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and all Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when He had said these things, they were looking on and He was lifted up and a cloud took Him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as He went, behold, two men stood by them with white robes and they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you in heaven will come in the same way you saw Him go into heaven. So Jesus ascends into heaven and He says, You've got to wait for the power from on high. And we'll get to that next week, the coming of the Holy Spirit and the impact that made. What is Jesus doing now? The Bible says that Jesus is now still has a human body. He could eat. The disciples could touch Him. He had a real body. Now He's ascended. He's at the right hand of the Father, sitting and praying for us. And every time somebody launches an accusation against us, Jesus is coming, Oh, Father, they're mine. They're, that's my boy. That's my girl. See? That's where Jesus is in His present ministry. But here's what He says. Because I died arose and ascended to the Father, now you are my witnesses. And, and it's your job now in life to love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength and neighbor as self by getting the message out. You can be forgiven. There is a way to deal with sin and guilt. Several of the men of our church decided to do this in a real way yesterday. Jason and Robin got these guys together to help build crosses and they stood on street corners all over the west, southwest side holding these crosses as people drove by on Saturday morning. And they've got many responses, positive and negative. But there they were. Why were they out there? Because Jesus said, because I've died and rose again, you will be my witnesses. Not I hope you are, but you will be. And so they took a big risk, identifying with Jesus, standing out there, reporting the empty cross. This is the fulfillment of all that Jesus said in his death and resurrection and ascension. So who do you say that I am? And what will you do with Jesus? John 14, 6 tells us why Christianity is an exclusive truth claim. Jesus said, as he's preparing his disciples for his own death, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said, I am the way, the only way. Many people say God is unknowable, but because I came as God in the flesh, you can know God, and you can be reconciled to Him. I am the way, Jesus says. Who is this man? He says, I am the truth. Standing before Pilate, Pilate said, what is truth? What is truth? He couldn't see that the truth was standing before him personified. And you must ask that question. Is Jesus telling the truth? Is He the way to truth? Does He reveal God as the only way to the truth? Does He reveal who we are? Third, he said, I am the life. We think that we can improve ourselves, moral improvement, New Year's resolutions, keeping the Ten Commandments, but we always fail. We can't measure up to the perfection of our God. But Jesus said, I am the life. Jesus said, I come to make dead people live, live. <laughs> Jesus said, we're living in a world of living dead men. But he said, I came to make people alive. Who do you say that I am and what will you do with me? Here's my question for you. Will you give up your pride and say, I can't do it without Him? I don't care what your background, what you've done in the past, anything about your past, your, your ethnicity, your sexuality, whatever it is. We all come to Jesus on level ground before that cross. And the first step is to admit, I am a guilty sinner and you are a resurrected Savior. And if you come to Jesus like that, he will make you alive. Let me give you an example. Some of us have been reading a book by a lady named Rosaria Butterfield. Rosaria Butterfield wrote a book called The Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert. This is a very intelligent young woman who is achieving great things, working on her PhD. At age 26, she came out and said, I'm a lesbian. Not to shock anyone, just to state who she was. By age 36, she was a full tenured professor at Syracuse University in the Department of English. A rising star, and by her own admission, a leftist philosopher. She wrote an article on the Promise Keeper movement, scalding this deluded group of men that meet in stadiums. And she published it in the local newspaper. This was back in the 90s. 
And as you can expect, she got many letters back, some saying, hooray, you're our hero, and others saying other things. But one letter stayed on her desk. She could not throw it away. It was a letter from a pastor who was a neighbor. And in the letter, the pastor had expressed some things, wondering how she was doing, and asked if she would accept an invitation to come to his home for dinner. He and his wife wanted to bring her in for dinner. She couldn't throw the letter away. She left it sitting there. And finally, she talked to a colleague about it and said, what do you think? And the colleague said, Rosaria, what is wrong with it? You're a researcher. This is a perfect opportunity to get into the inside of the religious right. Go for it. And so, at the colleague's urging, she accepted the invitation. And she she said, she went over to the pastor's home, not knowing what to expect. And they seemed like down-to-earth, common, ordinary people. And they sat down to dinner and The pastor said, do you mind if we pray for the meal before we eat? And she thought, sure. And she thought, oh, I've heard prayers before. I've been in these GBLT uh, marches where, you know, I've heard all kinds of Christians praying things. So she was kind of expecting this, this harsh prayer. And he bowed his head and he began to pray. And she said he began to confess his failings. And not just in a general way, Lord, forgive us for our failings. He was getting specific. Lord, I, I didn't reach out to this neighbor when I knew they had a need. Forgive me. I was harsh with my wife, and he was asking for forgiveness and then asking God's blessing on the food, and it kind of disarmed her. She thought, you know, he's confessing the same things that that I'm guilty of. And they had this meal, and she said she was shocked. He didn't say, hey, you need to come to my church, and let me tell you what the Bible says. She said it was a free-flowing conversation. They discovered they enjoyed the same kind of literature. She and and this man's wife uh, would read a lot of the same literature. And then he said to her, Rosaria, you're you're an English professor. Have you ever looked at the Bible as literature. You know, in the Bible there's poetry, there's history, there's apocalyptic literature, there's teachings. Have you ever looked at it from the standpoint of literary work? She never had. And she accepted his challenge and began to read the Bible. She said, I was like an addict to Oreos reading the Bible. She said, I just couldn't get enough. I read it. I read it in several translations. I read through the Bible several times in the course of a year. And all the time she's reading the Bible, she's becoming a friend of this pastor and his wife. Now what she did not know was that the pastor and his wife had been praying for Syracuse University and they've asked everyone in their church to get on their knees and pray for this lady. And she's reading the scripture and she's trying to figure out why are these people so kind to me and finally one of her friends said, Rosaria, the more you read the Bible, the more scared I get. You seem to be changing. And that scared her. She became panicky. But but she said it was like a river was flowing by and and I was dipping my toe in it, this river called Christianity, and I was dipping my toe in it and and I thought, what would happen if I'd fall into it? (laughs) So she began to go to Starbucks, which was right across from the church. She'd sit in the parking lot of Starbucks doing her research on Sunday mornings, drinking her coffee, looking across the street at this church. And she said, this church had a lot of homeschoolers. And she said, I learned homeschoolers have big families. And they would drive up in their 15 passenger vans and these kids would pile out and I'd go, whoa! So here she is in her car, butch haircut, her car plastered with gay and lesbian messages, watching. And finally, over time, she asked the pastor if she could come to church. Of course. And she said when she came into that church, people were kind to her. People were loving to her. And she didn't even know they were praying for her. And as she read the Bible and as she witnessed this loving community, she said, I began to feel like I could not just put my foot in the river. I had to jump in. But I was scared. And so she said, I got together with one of my homeschool friends that I'd met at church. And I said, listen to me. Listen to me. I got up this morning and left my girlfriend and came to this church. If I become a Christ follower... I know what I have to give up. I know what I'm going to have to give up academically. I know how many people are going to be hurt. What do you have to give up? And she said when she asked that question, the homeschooler moms that she talked to looked her right in the eye and said, let me tell you what we've had to give up. And she heard honest confessions, addictions, sexual lifestyles, painful past events. And one lady said to her, if I knew when I became a Christ follower that I would have to bury my child two years later, I don't know if I would have become a Christian. And with tears welling up in her eyes in this interview, she said, I learned that we all give up something to follow Jesus. We all have some death to ourselves, mainly our pride. 
And when she plunged into that river and Christ saved her, she said it was an excruciating conversion. She got into a lot of trouble with the university. A lot of her friends scandalized. But over the course of the next few years, she brought in so many of her friends into that church with their butch haircuts and alternate lifestyles. And that church loved them. What happened to Rosaria? She met the Christ who died for her sins, rose again, ascended to the Father's right hand, and imparted His life into her soul. Have you had Christ's life imparted into you? Have you come to that time where Jesus says, who do you say that I am? That you've admitted to the sin and guilt, real sin and guilt? And have you trusted Him as your Savior to forgive you? That is the good news of Easter. My prayer is that if you are there today, whatever your background, whatever pain that you have in your life, that you would come today to Him. I plead with you. Surrender your life to Jesus Christ. It won't be an easy life, but it will be a life filled with forgiveness, reconciliation, and healing. And who would want to give that up? Let's pray together. Lord, we're so grateful for what you did through your death on the cross, and I pray that we could receive your forgiveness because you took our penalty. We thank you for Resurrection Day because it proves that you were God in the human flesh and that you can impart your life to us and that you never leave us or forsake us. And I pray that if anyone is here today who does not yet know you, that today would be the day they surrender their lives and receive you as their Savior. That today would be the day that would change all Easter's to come. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, if you're our guest today, I hope you know this is a safe place to come and deal with the issues of life. We're going to love you. We're going to work with you. We want to take the journey with Jesus together. And now I hope you can go home and have some time with your families. May the love of Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And may the Lord pour out His blessing on you. Thank you for coming. Christ is risen. You're dismissed.